Hello and welcome back to Irish Football Fan TV. This is our Electricity League show and this week we're joined by Dean Clark and Limerick FC to talk through the European games and all the news that's happening around the league and Limerick's game on Friday against Galway as well. So we're going to get straight into things and we're going to go to the Europa League first from Thursday and Shamrock Rovers won starting in nil. Um, Josh, I'll start with you. Graham Burke, goal. Uh, I, I, predict, I predicted it on the preview show that he was either going to score or punch someone in the face within the first 40 <laughs> minutes of the game um, what's figure Rovers performance overall for the 90 minutes they're very good in the first half very very fluid um, Mila, Burke, the big players who are expected to perform, perform especially in the first half Rovers kind of dropped off a little bit in the second half but listening to Stephen Bradley after the match that was kind of always expected that Sterling no matter how kind of Young, they looked. They were still going to cause Rovers problems at times, and Rovers were kind of expecting that to be the case. And as well as a, it was kind of a game, game of two halves without standing, causing them too much trouble, too much trouble, especially in front of goal in the second half. Yeah, uh, Dean. Obviously, you were involved last year with Rovers um, around this time of year and the end of Pat Fenlon and stuff. Um, what was the difference this year? Do you think in that Rovers side? I don't know. Um, the draw maybe as well. Like I know. I watched that game the other night. I didn't get to see the first leg, but I didn't think they had an awful lot about them, that Sterling team. Um, yeah. Rovers, I thought, came out and... First half, they were a better team. They were they had a lot more about them. And then, being it's such a young team, and it was a big occasion for a big crowd that I think they had a two-goal lead. They kind of got, maybe got a bit apprehensive. Obviously, going to start dropping. Yeah. But I thought they dealt with it well. I watched the game. I was actually impressed with a few of the boys. Um, even I spoke to them. I spoke to one or two before uh, the game and about the game in the previous leg and they just said we'll beat them. They yeah. just they just knew like I saw from the standard but obviously last year it was actually it was what seemed to be the end for Pat Fennel when we lost that first leg to the R L P S or whatever they were. Exactly, called. yeah, Rops, yeah. Um yeah. La- Lapland FC or something. Yeah. Um so I don't know, it it just it was a game that just didn't go well and even over yeah. there we were we were better than them. It was just game plan didn't go well and yeah. I don't know. It's, just one of them things. That yeah, it was good. It was it was actually good because it was my first time playing in Europe and it's good. Like it's an unbelievable experience to go away and yeah. Obviously, I had charter flights and whatever. So, so much made out of it in the media and stuff. But I don't know. It is. It was such a disappointment for me, like personally, just because I it was something I really wanted to do and really like. Yeah. Really look forward to it for so long and I don't know. I I can't, I can't tell you what the difference of the road team there because I'm not there anymore. So. Yeah. But um, speaking of kind of the Rovers team and the forward players, in the first half they looked really impressive. Obviously, Grant Burke in the middle of it, and then Brando and Trevor Clark either side of it. You play, you played with Brando and Trev. How good are those two lads in an attacking sense to play with? Well, at the end of the day, like you just look at Brando's highlights. Yeah. And how many goals? I don't think he scores bad goals. Like, yeah. um, and same with Trev. Trev's only new to the league, like, and he's so much to be made of him. I remember my first training with Trev, and he was only. He just kind of came back from the 19th and he was strong, he was quick and he didn't he didn't give a shit about who he was tackling or anything. Yeah. He'd just fly into lads and I remember lads, he was kind of, he had a, he had a not a swag about him, but he has an attitude about him. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? If he wouldn't be afraid to have a bite at one day, lads, like something he's like Darren comp- McCabe. He's, he's confident yeah, he himself, yeah. Um, and I think he will, the sand to him, like I think he's a bit of a hothead which also helps him as well. Like You don't yeah. see him pulling out of tackles, you don't see him, you know what I mean? Um be afraid of him in the league, so I don't think he'll change it no matter where he played. If he went over to England, I don't think that would change either. Yeah. Um. So no, they have some good players, and at the end of the day, Brando's only what twenty three. Yeah. Trails what nineteen. Graham Burke's my age, twenty four. Like. Yeah. So they have some good players there, like, and I know, I think, they have a good manager. I'll put them together, like. Yeah. Uh, Josh, speaking of managers and speaking of Stephen Bradley, is getting the is getting over the first hurdle in Europe vindication for the Rovers board sticking with him after. The second half of last season, or does he need to continue to do well in the league and kind of finish out the season, get another win and a tie in Europe against Mlada Boleslav the next couple of weeks as well, to kind of vindicate the appointment of such an inexperienced guy at this level? Well, I remember when he was appointed and the first kind of few signings were announced, and one thing, I think I interviewed him one-to-one, I think one of the things he said to me was, you'll never see a bunch, kind of a bunch of kids out there again. It'll be a blend of experience and that'll really show. And at the start of the season, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm watching the same stuff as last season. Nothing really seems to have changed here. But as time goes on, he, he's won me over a little bit, especially watching a couple of starting games now. 
he seems to really kind of they, they seem to be blending together when the likes of James Downer or Aaron Bulger go on and play it doesn't really seem to be affecting the team as much and he's done a really good job in like blending them in and not really making them feel like outsiders going into going into a team that are like even though Grant, the likes of are only 24 they're still what 5-6 years older older than the likes of yeah and lads who have kind of had obviously Berkeley's been a villain he's been at Notts County and stuff he's kind of he's got experience at a high enough level of football outside of Ireland as well and has that kind of life experience of being away as well I think that helps younger players coming back into the league who've maybe been away for a few years even Trev who was at Middlesbrough for a while mm. you know helps players like that I think when they have gone away and stuff to be maybe more mature in a young team yeah. but obviously you worked under Stevie the second half of last season a little bit and he was involved before that I think and what is he like as a coach? And was this kind of the way they're starting to play now a little bit? Was this what he was trying to get ingrained into the side at the end of last season as well? And it was just that it was going to always take time to change the system from what Nutty had been playing? Well, I think it's hard to change for a manager. If you have one group of players and they've been kind of playing a certain way, it's hard to completely change the way they're going to play in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why Brad's in fairness to me. He has a lot of belief in his, in his young players. And he, when he brings some through, he really does like... Put a lot of faith in them. Yeah. Um. That's why even myself. That's why I'm not there anymore. I, Brad came to me and said, "Look, I want to do it my own players. I want to do it my own way." And I said, yeah. "I like." In fairness to him, he came to me early with it. He gave me time to check out my options, and he didn't do it in a spiteful way. He could have left me hanging and yeah, whatever. So in fairness to me, I think he's he's. I think he's going to do well. Like um. How long he gets, you never know because the Rovers they kind of swap and change and. Yeah. But like I like you said there, will that be a justification to kind of give him a lot just from getting through Europe? I don't know because football fans like like myself, like yeah. short memories like Yeah. Like if Rovers obviously got knocked there next round, got knocked to the FA Cup, went on a bad run the league. Don't finish in the top three all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah, all of a sudden it's a terror it's a disaster of leagues, uh, yeah. league campaign and disaster of season, so Yeah. I don't know, it's you can only wait and see. It's still so early for a manager, like um yeah. Well, we now just past halfway line, so I'd say give him time. Like, like yeah. I, 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 I'd hate to see him go within the next year because he signed a long term contract and it's just starting all over again. And yeah, exactly. You're just rebooting the operation for what seems to be, I think, off the top of my head, maybe the fifth or sixth time since Mick O'Neill left, and that's only five or six years. Yeah, and to be honest, I just so. don't think it works. Like, I've seen it firsthand where a new manager comes in, they have to be given time, and then they have the excuse of, uh, it's not my players do it my own way and then at what point do you say right you've had enough time because at the yeah. end of the day it's you're working with limited budgets you're not working where you can't bring in exactly who you want everywhere so yeah. I think it is it's so tough like to be a manager in this league yeah. and ex- be expected to like have success straight away because it's not going to happen unless you do get lucky like yeah we'll move on then to the league leaders who also progressed in the Europa League we're actually not really going to talk about um Derry, because you kind of spoke about them in our previous show for the second leg, and the fact that their tie was kind of dead already. Um, and I haven't actually seen the game or even read a report on it because they got beaten again 4 1 by Midland. But we'll move on to kind of Cork and 4 2 win against Lavadia. It looked a little bit shaky at times, but yeah, sure did, yeah. um, Sean McGuire hat trick after Carl Shepard had um, got the first goal for Cork. Yeah. Season three to play AL Limassol. Um, what do you think overall, Josh, of a 6-2 aggregate win for Cork against a team who were probably a better side than we gave them credit for after the first leg? Yeah, it's it was it's great for Cork. Like, I mean, they've they've overcome so many hurdles this year, beating Dundalk a couple of times, and it would be very easy for them to get complacent going into Europe, and I, I will just turn up again and win, but it just doesn't seem to be the attitude of any of the Cork players. I mean, you look at the likes of Sean Maguire, he's hungry, Carl Shepard, Stephen Dooley, Greg Bulger, Gary Buckley, they're all players that play with a serious hunger in the team. And I think that's why the 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 scoreline was so emphatic over the two legs. They didn't drop off at any point and just yeah. and just stopped playing. They they ensured the job was done. Dean, Cork this season in general and in particular on Thursday, they're a very impressive side, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Like I we haven't fared too well against them this season. Um Nobody has. No, no yeah, I was gonna say nobody <laughs> has. Uh <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. It's not too much of a change team from last year. Um, yeah. They've just they just hit the ground running and haven't stopped. Uh, yeah. When that'll happen? Maybe if Shawnee leaves and when Kev O'Connor leaves, it might bounce all team and they might struggle to replace them. I don't know. But like at the moment, they seem, they're just flying. Yeah. Um, Shawnee as well. Like I'm not, like it's 
it was the worst kept secret in the league ever that he was going to get a move and where he was yeah. going. Um, but I'm delighted for him because he's a lovely lad and he, like, he's just doing the business every week. He got, like Playing against him, it wouldn't even mind if it wasn't his goals, it was his all around play, it was, yeah. it was his hold of play, his link up play, his passing, all the little bits that maybe just go a bit unnoticed if he wasn't scoring the goals. Yeah. But, um, no, I don't. And then obviously on Shawnee and moving to Preston and stuff, obviously Simon Grayson after signing him has now moved on and taken the Sunderland job. As a player yourself, have you ever been in a position where you've kind of been brought into a club and then the manager has suddenly changed hands and suddenly maybe you're not his cup of tea anymore when you probably weren't the manager before? Well, I've had the last <coughs> two years, I suppose. When Brad came in, obviously he was yeah. a new manager who I signed for. Then again, this year with Neil McDonald coming in after, obviously I'd played under Martin for years and... Yeah. knew exactly what I was going to get out of Martin and then now it's completely changed for us so it is huge and I say he is now a bit thinking oh Jesus Christ what am I getting into but yeah. first he signed a two three year contract on what I can presume was good money so I think it can't be the worst thing in the world but at the end of the day he's going to be ambitious and he's going to think look is my playing time going to kind of disappear but I don't know I think he's good enough to go over there and impress any manager yeah, I don't even know how they. Yeah, they have Alex Neil who managed um, Norwich in the Premier League last time they were there. Yeah, a bald Scottish fella. Oh yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Didn't like Wes Hill on. No, that guy. <laughs> so I don't know. We only wait and see. I hope, like, I fingers crossed him that he goes over and does well. But yeah, you never know. That's football, isn't it? That's yeah, exactly. We'll move on then, and we'll kind of obviously we've got the first legs of the two European ties on Thursday. Um, for the two Irish sides and we've got Cork against AEL Limassol Josh I'll go to you first for a prediction on it what do you think first leg wise obviously AEL Limassol got a massive result against St. Joseph's with Gibraltar but I don't know how much you can really read into any team who beats a Gibraltar East team look I think it's going to be I think it'll be a tight game uh, I think AEL have got a, a decent enough reputation yeah they've got a serious amount of Cypriot internationals yeah. but uh, you know, can't remind me <laughs> about Ireland and Cyprus, but yeah. uh, no, I think Paddy Kenny's not in goal for Cork. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think Cork are going to be all right, and I, I, I don't think it'll be as straightforward as the as the Levadia game, but I still yeah. fancy them to do a job. Uh, probably one nil. I got go, a goal for Sean McGuire, another goal. I kind of see that determination that he's really, really determined to see out the the end of his Cork career and I. Yeah, kind of leave Cork in a better position than he found them in. I think. Then, what do you think as far as that game? Are they home or away in the first leg? Uh, Cork are away in the first leg, aren't they? Yeah, I think Cork might be away in the yeah. first leg, and the Rovers are at home. If I know John Caulfield, then I'd say he'd be setting up for a draw. Yeah. Just to make sure he doesn't concede, I'd say I'll go one all or else nil all. Yeah. Um. I don't think there'll be too many goals in the game unless maybe a few of the boys have worldies. But I'd say I'm going to go one all draw. Okay. And then we'll bounce straight back then. Rovers against Mlada Boleslav of the Czech Republic. Um, obviously Mlada only got into the Europa League based off um, I think Sparta Prague winning the Czech Cup because um, they didn't actually finish in the European places. So they're the weakest of the four Czech teams coming in to the Europa League but they're also a side who consistently get to the third qualifying round of this they've got to the third qualifying round the last three times they've entered the Europa League so what do you see for Rovers at home in the first leg? I don't know um, it all depends once again how the boys turn up I hope they do well yeah. um, they'll want to score won't they? they will they'll have to score but I think they will concede as well um, they've conceded quite a lot of goals in the league this year yeah. I know they obviously didn't against Starn but they've conceded I think the most goals of any team outside the bottom four in the league yeah. Rovers have this year, so I'm gonna go for a one all again. I think I don't know if they'll win. I don't know if they have enough in to win again. But yeah, I'll go one all. I think they'll concede as well. Okay, Josh. I'm gonna go with two one three for hours. Okay, I'm gonna be more positive because <laughs> the colours to the mass Rovers fan. <laughs> um, I'll go two one Rovers, but I think the away goal might come back to bite them in the second leg. Um, I hope it doesn't, but. I have a feeling that Mike and Mike Simple prediction, that, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to make specific ones. Um, and then I'll go 2-0 Cork against Ayala and Masala. I think Cork will probably be too strong for them. Um, we'll move on then. Uh, your own game on Friday night. 3-1 defeat to Galway. Mm. Had, what went wrong? Galway, obviously a team who just consistently draw every single week, it seems. Yeah. So they've kind of finally got the second league win the season. What went wrong for yourself? Just had to pinpoint it. Um, to be honest, I don't know. It was a game I thought we were completely dominating for a majority of the game, and then 
when you see the goal back around the Morris Ronan Murray scored an absolute worldly thirty yard half volley top in um and it kind of really kind of broke us a bit at, for that minute and we can see the two minutes again two minutes later and then that was I think around the thirty eight minutes so then we were kind of chasing the game straight away up until half time yeah and obviously when things like that happen in football everyone forgets it and that's good been doing and it turns into what was that what was that what are we doing boys everything everything just goes wrong once you can see like um. Yeah. And then we came my second half and we were just chasing the game and then I'd say he made a few changes then around the 16 minute try freshen it up and then we conceded again from a long I think it was from my memory about it was a, it was I think it was, came from a, either the goal kick or else out of the keeper's hand and yeah. whatever way they man we defenders didn't deal with it and they end up going three 0 up um, and then at that stage we're obviously we're thinking we're playing bottom of the league here. I know Galway aren't losing any games, but we're thinking we yeah. have to go there and win. And especially the position we're in, that if we had a one, we would have leapfrogged Derry. I think only two points off Rovers with a yeah. game in hand. So and only what three points and off Bray as yeah. well. Yeah. So for us it was a disaster just because what could have been. So yeah. Obviously we've a tough couple of weeks coming up now. So yeah. Uh, Josh on. Um, the Li- on Limerick and Galway and kind of Limerick in general since McDonald took over, what have you kind of made of the early, early stages of McDonald's time? Well, I think it was always going to be obvious something coming in that, like said, Dan here and the rest of his kind of teammates won't get as much freedom as you would with Martin, and that that's always going to be the case. I think he, from what I've seen, he's probably the the manager that's given the most freedom to any player I've ever seen. Yeah. So, that and the. Uh, and a kind of stereotypical English manager who worked for, where he worked for a long time with, at West Ham with Sam Allardyce, I think you probably knew what you were going to get. Mm. Is it is it a bit of a culture shock for all the lads at Limerick then that kind of you've gone from playing with Martin who obviously tries to play as attractive around the football as he can, give his attacking players as much freedom as possible and try and, you know, score lots of goals. Obviously, his time at UCD, especially some of the... Some of the score lines that used to be produced yeah. in UCD games back when you were there and stuff were ridiculous score lines. Yeah, um, Martin seemed to really just rely on okay, Dave O'Connor and McLee here back there at centre half. Let's hope they hold the fourth down yeah, and yeah. let's try and score five or six. So, is it a big kind of difference with Neil McDonald coming in and kind of being probably a more God, not a, not an older, outdated style of football because it still works for a lot of managers. Sam Allardyce showed that at Palace that it kind of still works, but a very di- very different style of football to what you were you what you've especially been used to yeah. over the years. Um, no, I think it is. I think especially for our defenders more so than anyone because you've gone from from being one extreme almost to the other in terms of play, play, play to hoof. <laughs> I wouldn't. Yeah, maybe use that word, but yeah. I just, no messing at the back. Yeah. Um, so it comes into players' heads, I think, long time. Say, I don't know, different scenarios where you could be at the back and you get the ball at your feet. And the first thing, like, it's right, because the lads have been playing under Martin there for, what, two and a half years? Yeah. So it's the first thing you're thinking is, where can I pass it? Where you, then you have the gaffer scream, like you're saying, diag or get rid of a channel. Yeah. And I think it could, like, that's why I think it does, for that sort of change, it can take time. Yeah. Um, especially with that rootless kind of defending mentality that he wants, as opposed to kind of... Probably makes you guys like in the forward positions have to work harder as well defensively. Well, it just means you get the ball in different scenarios where, yeah. like, a lot of time I'd be getting it either almost always defeat or else kind of. I don't know, it's the whole kind of way you play changes. Yeah. Um, where he got like he likes playing with using off the big man Roddy up top and using Chidozi now as a striker as opposed to being a winger. Yeah. Um, so even Chidozi's game now, someone like Chidozi who has typically been a winger and the way he receives the ball and how he would go at someone has completely changed. He doesn't get those opportunities yeah. anymore. Even the areas he's kind of picking the ball up and the ball's being played into him, it's just entirely different. Than an yeah, entirely well, he used to change his game. Ball. Like He now yeah. has to play with his back to goal the majority of the time or else kind of work off instinct now and play off the big round Roddy because where typically he would have got the ball, received the ball and looked up and had people in front of him or else defenders to go at where it doesn't happen for him anymore. So I yeah. think he's had to change his game. And fair to me, he's done well. Like, the likes of Chilozzi has benefited from him because he scored... Four or five goals in the last number of games, so yeah. um, like I think it just and I, I keep saying it, but I think it does take time for that that amount to change because it's not just fans who come to the game and just see what they see in the pitch. Where we now have like a completely different schedule, we now our training is completely different. The way we prepare for games is completely different. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and it takes it takes us and the lads to get used to it as well because it is a huge difference for us. Like. Yeah. Well, obviously you've got, as you mentioned in there, Rodrigo Tossi has come in, Brazilian striker, and I'm sure you probably didn't know a lot about him and a lot of the lads yeah. probably didn't know much about him when he walked in the door, but he's been very impressive since he came in as a player. Have you kind of been maybe a little bit shocked by just how much of an impact he's made? Well, I was shocked when he got a hat-trick on the first game, all right. Yeah. Um, especially because, no, we kind of knew because leading up to that game, we knew because we'd obviously seen him in training a lot. And I remember the first day he came in and just his head in the bill. I've never seen someone head the ball as well as he has in this league. Yeah. Um, and I remember just the first day, I think Ian Turner put a cross in for him. And just when he went up and won it, we were all just, chase who's this fella? Yeah. Um, now, granted, he can't move much, but I don't think the type of player he is, he doesn't have to yeah. do the sort of running. Um. So I think, yeah, he settled in very well. Like, obviously, I don't know how many players in the league have come to and scored a hat-trick on their debut. Yeah, I um, don't, it's definitely, I'd say, less than 10 anyway. Yeah, so, I don't know, yeah, I'm delighted for him because he's a lovely lad and uh, he's been around and he has a lot of experience and he's yeah. good around the dressing room.